Hello, I'm Adam Zuckerman, your host for today's USO Military Virtual Programming event. Now, today's guest needs no introduction. He's a primetime Emmy Award-winning producer. We're talking Marvel Cinematic Universe with Captain, Aven Captain America, The Avengers. He's produced Arrested Development, Community, Happy Endings, so many. Anthony Russo, on behalf of the Russo brothers, it's great to have you here. Let's hop in. Hi, Adam. How you doing? I'm doing well. Where are you joining us from today? I am in Los Angeles, California, and uh, we have an office sort of adjacent to downtown Los Angeles where my brother and I work on it. All right, not bad. Now, for all of you, uh, you who are service members and family members around the world, please remember you can use the Q&A chat feature to submit your questions for Anthony to answer. We'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Now, what are you working on these days? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're up to. Well, we are in the process of releasing a movie called Cherry uh, that we've been working on for the past uh, couple years, uh, which is based on a novel written by Nico Walker, who is a veteran. And it's a story, it's a fictionalized story, but it's uh, inspired by uh, some of his real life experiences of both serving in the military and his experiences after service, dealing with some issues like PTSD and opioid addiction. All right. Now, I'm sure that we'll get back to that in a bit, but the, the tie-in is really important, and we're here for a reason. That's the USO. What is the importance of the USO in participating today to you? Well, look, we, I, I mean, I, like all Americans, I feel like I, I owe an immense uh, gratitude and debt to everyone who serves. Mm -hmm. So in any way that my brother and I have been able to sort of participate and help support uh, our service members is always a privilege and an honor for us to be able to do and participate in. So, um, yeah, we, we, we all owe a debt. Okay. So we already have a few questions that are coming in. This one's from Jennifer Behar. How has the pandemic affected by making the movie Cherry? Well, fortunately, we were able to finish shooting Cherry just before uh, we finished at, at the end of January, a year ago. So we finished just before things started to go into lockdown, which was good. So we were basically in lockdown while we were in what's called post-production on the movie, editing the film. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do a lot of our work remotely, fortunately, where my brother Joe and I could be connected like this with our editor, Jeff Groth, and we would work remotely on the film. Um, and that ended up being surprisingly effective. Um, but that, you know, on, on a way, and we also were prepping a movie uh, called The Gray Man, which is, uh, uh, ba again, based on a novel like Cherry, and it's set in the world of the CIA. Uh, that's a movie we've been prepping. We were hoping to start shooting that movie uh, a few weeks ago in the middle of January, but we had to push because of the circumstances, and we're hoping to be able to start shooting uh, the middle of March now. Um, but really, you know, part of my work ends up being remote, you know, and, and digital work, which which is can function and flow during the um, pandemic. But uh, part of it, you know, you need to be with other people. Um, so that part has been slowed and slowed by the pandemic. Now let's give you a special live look in to Major General Seeley, at Joint Forces Staff College in Norfolk, Virginia. Major General, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Can you see me okay, Adam? I can. Great to have you here. Hey, uh, Anthony, great, uh, great op honor and, uh, and thank you for the USO and of course yourselves for, uh, for joining us. And uh, of course, like anybody, a huge fan of, of the Marvel uh, universe and, and what you've done, you know, for, uh, for cinema, really. Um, and, uh, and I just, you know, kind of a quick thing uh, for me, I've, I've got 32 years in the, in the Marine Corps. Uh, I've served six times in Iraq over my lifetime, just coming back last year. Um, and, and, and the tie-in with uh, in, in, uh, Infinity War is because I went back for my sixth time. I'm able to, you know, rightfully wear and drink, you know, my uh, my Thanos mug because I burned all the Infinity Stones, you know, uh, known as the Mad Titan around work. Um, I love a, it. a quick question though about, uh, about about what you do is as a senior leader, right? Now I know you get a lot of questions about cinema and movies. Um, you know, we're trained at our level to you know, to really convey a, a, a vision of the battlefield, right? And that's, that's based on friction with an enemy, weather, enemy terrain, you know, those, an opposing will. Uh, and, and I would 
assume that again you have a vision for your movies uh, you know and i look forward to cherry by the way it looks the 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 the, the trailers are great um so you've got you know you've got this vision for a movie so how do, how do you convey that vision to your troops so to speak so that it can all come together and i know that your resources your friction is really about resources and time i i granted you know but are there opposing wills out there that you have to wrestle with to get your vision Really interesting question. First of all, it's, it's, it's an honor for me to meet you and to be here and thank you so much for your service. Um, the, uh, yeah, like movie making is, is logistically complicated. Now it's not anywhere near as complicated as what you have to deal with and the stakes of what you're dealing with. It's a different thing, obviously, but yes, it, it is logistical, logistically complicated because it literally involves hundreds, if not thousands of people. You know, we always say like when you when a movie ends and you see all those names going by, it's like those names are there is because it takes all those people and even more to actually make the movie. So, you know, it, it is a big uh, endeavor. Um, so the way Joe and I do it is, you know, we grew up in a big like Italian American family. So we're very used to like uh, sort of working as a unit, sort of, uh, you know, it's so, sort of that old school family sort of hierarchy. And um, we, you know, Joe and I, because we work as a team, you know, we're constantly communicating with each other. That's basically, basically our entire process is a nonstop dialogue with one another about what we're doing, what we wanna do and how we're gonna do it. So we just continue that process, I think through our sort of that, that family history that we have we just start to pull other people into that process that he and I have with one another, that dialogue. And of course, you gotta be careful about who you invite into that process. You wanna make sure that they're, those people are there for the right reasons, that they're, they're focused in the way that you are, they understand the mission, everyone's putting the movie first before any other issues. You know, and if so, if you have the right collaborators, if you have people built properly for it, and you just, our process is just pick the right people and then invite them into that process that we have. And it's really all of us just making a movie together, knowing what our roles are and just having a free flowing communication between us so that everyone is constantly understanding one another and we're, and we're, and we're bettering our ideas. Uh, Joe and I have this policy. It's like, we, we say best idea wins and, and we don't care where the idea comes from. So we're constant, our process is constantly sort of looking for that best idea. How do we better what we're trying to achieve? And yeah, we include all of our collaborators in that process. So, um, but, but, you know, there certainly are times when you're running out of time and there, there might be uh, not, there not, may not be clarity in terms, in terms of what the best idea is, where it does really boil down to somebody at the top, just making the call. And that's the answer. You know. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Major General, thanks for joining us today. Love the mug. Before you go, I'm going to show you this. Here's, here's my favorite Thanos mug. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Major General. Thank you, sir. All right, Anthony, we've got a few questions for you from Libra Hasselflug. Uh, Cherry is a sad and hard story. How is the cast and everyone else able to switch back and forth and keep it light on set? That's a great question. You know, every actor is different um, and every director is different. You know, it, it ends up being a function of personality and how you, how you practice your craft. There are some actors who train for, to sort of in a more technical way. So their acting is accessed more on their voice control, their body control, certain, certain ways they sort of control the intention in their voice, et cetera. Some actors approach it in a very emotional, pro, uh, pro, have a very an emotional process where they have to work themselves into an emotional space. Uh, and then they're sort of drawing their energy from that. And so it, it's interesting because actors who work more emotionally generally have to be more focused when, the, when you call cut, because you can't just turn emotions on and off that easily. Um, so those actors will tend to stay in a space that they need to be in. And if that space is a more serious space, then they, then they tend not to be very um, relaxed, you know, or casual mm -hmm. between takes. Whereas actors who work more technically can kind of turn it on and off very quickly. So it, it's interesting, it's different. And I will say, you know, Chadwick Boseman, and it's very tragic and sad that he's no longer with us, but 
he was really fascinating because he's that type of actor that builds his character very deeply in his core. And so he doesn't let the character go while he's working. He, when we would work with him, he would speak in his Wakandan accent, even when he wasn't shooting. He was very quiet when he wasn't shooting, very focused. And he carried that aura of T'Challa with him, even when he wasn't working. Now there's many actors in the Avengers who are the opposite. I would say most of the actors in the Avengers are kind of the opposite of that. Whereas like you call cut and the next thing they're doing is, you know, sticking their finger up somebody's nose. You know, it's very like casual and fun, but it's, it's interesting. And as a director, you have to kind of create a space on set to accommodate both. You know, you want to make sure that actors have their space when, for those who need it. But the, at the same time, you want to make sure that certain actors can, can turn it off when they need to so they can relax. All right, thank you. So here's a question about your process and the evolution of that process. It's from Elliot Shine. It says, you and your brother have had such an incredible career in filmmaking and television. Do you feel that Cherry would have been a vastly different story if you made it prior to your work in television, Arrested Development and Community at all, and the Marvel films? Did the past 10 years of work inform and better prepare you to tell this dramatic narrative? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, for Joe and I think of Cherry as uh, in a way, it's a return to where we started as filmmakers. You know, we started as like very low budget independent filmmakers and our, our early work was highly experimental and expressionistic, very, very non-commercial. Mm -hmm. And we made an early movie called Pieces that never got released that was very aggressive on a stylistic level and very, very sort of uh, riotous on a stylistic level. And that movie wasn't seen as commercial or useful by many, m almost everybody in the business, but uh, Steven Soderbergh, a fellow filmmaker actually saw that movie, one of the greatest directors we have. He responded to it creatively and he helped bring us into the business uh, and produce a new movie for us because they liked that movie so much. Mm -hmm. But that movie, I don't think would have, you know, that movie wouldn't have gotten us anywhere had, had a fellow artist not seen it and recognized something special in it because it was so stylistically aggressive. Cherry is very much inspired by that period of our career. Uh, it's, it's, Cherry, Cherry is designed, and this is motivated by the novel that it's based on. The novel that it's based on is very subjective to the lead character, meaning he's going through a lot of experiences in the book that where he's got an inner life and an inner experience of what, what's happening that's, that's very different from the outer experience. And that's sort of what's fun and fascinating about the book is how different our inner lives can sometimes be from our exterior lives. Um, we were very much trying to portray the character's inner life in Cherry. So we were using a lot of stylized techniques to portray what his inner emotional state is or his inner psychological state is. And I'll give you an example. There's a scene in the movie where he's having a problem. He's a young person, maybe 19 years old. He goes to the bank, he's having a problem. The bank sort of incorrectly uh, penalized him for something and, and an overdraft. So he's trying to explain to the teller uh, about the error and the teller is sort of being very unhelpful. And so as he's talking to the teller, the teller, we, we lit the teller completely uh, in shadow. So he literally can't make out any features in her face. And it was meant to represent this fact that he's, he's dealing with an institution that he doesn't know how to access, that doesn't have a human face. Um, and that isn't helpful to him um, and is, you know, sort of alienated from him. So there's a lot of techniques in the movie like that. And I, I think a lot of those techniques go back to the beginning of our career. But to get back to your question, certainly you grow as a filmmaker and you, you learn things. And we've learned a lot through our experience with television and our experience in the MCU. But I would say the biggest difference would be um, if we had made this movie before uh, earlier in our career is that it would not have had Tom Holland playing the lead. That, that's, that's a pretty big difference and, and would have changed the movie substantially. And, and as the producer and the director, there's so many different angles. Uh, before we go to another live look in, we've got one question that came in from Casey. Uh, my question is, what's it like working with Tom Holland, which is directly back to what you just mentioned? <laughs> it's amazing. Tom Holland is, you know, as you can probably guess from watching him on screen, he's a phenomenal talent. Mm -hmm. uh, he's as talented as any actor we've ever worked with. He's as hardworking as any actor we've ever worked with. He's an extremely good person. He's a very brave actor. He's not afraid of trying things. So he's like, he's the ideal collaborator. And, you know, Joe and I, you know, from the very first time we cast him as Spider-Man when he was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. 
And from that point forward, we worked with them for th over three movies, several years. We developed a very close relationship with him. He's a very good friend of ours and, and uh, one of our most important collaborators. This movie wouldn't have been, Cherry couldn't have been half of what it is without him. He, he, the Cherry's a challenging story. It's a difficult story on many levels. And Joe and I also feel like it's an important story. So we want people to see this film. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to make the film in a way where it would be accessible to audiences, where they would feel like, you know, you want people to be able to come to this movie and recommend it to others after they walk away from it. So part of the, we, that affected a lot of our choices about how we made the film, but one of the most important ones was casting Tom Holland because Tom, he's such a good actor. He's so likable, so charismatic, so empathetic that you will go with him to places not a lot of other character, actors can take you to. Uh, you know, you're, you're gonna be along for the ride with him. You're gonna empathize with him despite the fact he may make some poor choices or, um, or, or just find himself in difficult situations he's not handling, handling well. You can still follow him through those experiences. And that was really critical to us. So he was very much our, our partner, filmmaking partner in this movie on every level. And um, I hope we make many more movies with him. All right, well, talking about charisma, let's bring you to another location that is not where you are. It's the 603rd Air Communication Squadron in Germany. Colonel, are you with us? Wow. Let's uh, get your audio unmuted. There we go. Welcome. We're here. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I am Lieutenant Colonel Angela Meyer, and I am the commander of the 603rd Air Communication Squadron, and we're stationed at Ramstein Air Base, Germany. So we're part of the 603rd Air Operations Center, and our mission is to operate, maintain, and defend the networks that enable command and control for the U.S. Air Forces in Europe and Africa. So today I'm joined by my heritage team and members of my squadron whom have prepared questions for you. So with that, I am going to pass it over to my Lieutenant, Lieutenant Bartholomew to share with you a little history on where we started with our Avengers heritage journey. Wow, thank you very much. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Lieutenant David Bartholomew from New Orleans, Louisiana. And I am one of three uh, members of the squadron heritage team. Our squadron is part of a proud heritage of signal companies and communication squadrons. During World War II in March of 1943, before heading to the Pacific to support the war effort, our original heritage squadron, the 340th Signal Company, whose name and mission was classified, was referred to as the Avengers. Our Air Force historians directly co connected us to the 340th Signal Company through six different name and location changes, including California, England and Germany. In order to keep up with our lineage and maintain the integrity of our heritage, we, the 603rd Air Communication Squadron, unofficially use the call sign Avengers. We are proud and honored to celebrate such an amazing legacy created by the 340th. And to continue that legacy, are our airmen and Space Force guardians to ask you some questions. Let me say, that was amazing to learn and it's, it's a thrill to meet the real Avengers. So thank you. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Morning. Could you introduce yourself and ask your question? Oh yes, definitely. So my name is Tafane Renu. I'm a senior airman. I'm from Inglewood, California. Um, so if you flew into LAX, I'm pretty sure you know exactly where that is. I'm not, I'm not far from Inglewood right now, yeah. <laughs> um, so my question is, as members of the armed forces, we are charged with service before self in defending our country. How has the military's experiences and sacrifices been an inspiration for any of the movies and or specific heroes? Great. The, look, my brother and I entered the MCU with the movie Captain America Winter Soldier. So we, you know, our point of access to the entire uh, Marvel universe as, as filmmakers was Captain America. So that was a very, that was a, that was a thrill for us and an honor for us. Um, we take it very seriously. We, you know, look at, it, it's always complicated when you're making a fantasy film and you're using as an inspiration real life people and real life heroes who are in life and death situations. You know, we never want to, it's, it's hard because you want to make sure you don't overstate the sort of connection. 
Um, because again, you know, storytelling is different than the lives that you guys are living. Um, but certainly the, the real life experience of service people is the, is the grounding, that, that the emotional grounding that we try to take for, for these characters, specifically Captain America, and now with our new movie, Cherry, as well. Um, but it's been a massive inspiration to us. It's, um, there's a part of me that always uh, regrets that I never took the opportunity to serve. And I was very excited when a few months ago, my 14 year old daughter told me that she was becoming interested in military service. So um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be meeting all of you. And in many ways, uh, what you do and has been an inspiration to us. Thank you. Is there another member with a question? That's a nice shield you have in the background. <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> All right. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. My name is Tech Sergeant Christopher Kidder, and I'm from Anchorage, Alaska. My question to you is, we see the positive effects your movies have in inspiring our airmen to stand up and be the heroes America needs. In your work and partnership with the military, how have those interactions inspired you or changed your outlook on what it means to be a hero in 2021? Well, I would say... The thing that's most been that's been most inspiring is the level of dedication. You know, that's something that my brother and I really admire because you know it's again. I think part of what is so inspiring about military service and military service members is that you have an experience that is more more extreme in many ex uh, respects than the civilian experience but that some, it's something that civilians can relate to in many ways. Like the emotions and the situations that you face are sort of a more extreme example of a lot of emotions and situations that we face in civilian life. And we can look to the military, um, even though we don't have those exact experiences, we can still look to the military for, for inspiration in terms of how you deal with those situations, how you handle those situations, both on a realistic, uh, in terms of the choices you make, but also in terms of the way you process the emotions and the experience that you've had um, with those things. And I think that's one thing that has been most inspiring to us is just following how you process it on an emotional level. And I think one of the most inspiring things is the, the level of dedication that we have seen, because we feel like that we, you know, in order to be a filmmaker, it takes a lot of dedication. You know, it, you know, I, I, you know, it is, it is difficult being a filmmaker. It's not, not nearly as difficult as what you all do, but it's difficult. And there's a lot of people that want to make movies. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to sort of make your movie stand out, etc. It takes a lot of dedication and relentless dedication over a long period of time in order to, to, to realize your agenda as a filmmaker. And I think that that's one thing I've always responded to in service members is that level, that level of dedication, that level of focus, and that sort of the humility of service. Um, because again, I think for my brother and I, we don't pursue filmmaking as like an ego exercise. You know, it's like, we really do believe that the movie is bigger than all of us. And it's something that we're serving. And it's something that, that you know, because why bother? You know, if the movie isn't something bigger than you, what's the point of making it in the first place? So I, I would say those are the things that whenever I, 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 I can find those qualities feel even more pro pronounced in service members. And I really admire that and am and, 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 and inspired by that. Thank you. Very Thank good. you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Hi there, good morning. I'm Senior Airman Smathers and I'm from Northern California. Hope you guys have a great day today. Question for you is, with help from our Air Force historians, we found a 1940s newspaper article referencing our heritage signal company as the Avengers. So in your extensive research, what information can you share with us about the history of the name Avengers and where the idea originated? Oh my gosh. I know I'm hitting you with the hard one, but you got, you got it. I wish I had that <laughs> I wish I had that question ahead of time. It's the, the Scantron <laughs> question of the day. Please choose bubble A or B. <laughs> you know, uh, for my brother and I, we worked very closely with um, Chris Marcus and Steve McFeely, who are mm -hmm. a writer team who wrote all the Marvel movies that we did. And those 
two are the sort of real experts on the history <laughs> of everything. <laughs> so I wish they were here for right. <laughs> but I actually don't know. I don't know the history, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I got the question. No one knows. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> we me. had to have one. But now that now that you've stumped me, I know what I'm doing after uh, after this is over. It just means <laughs> it just means we'll have to talk to you guys again. Yeah, and I'll know <laughs> Anthony, we apologize for giving you homework. Let's get to the next question. Thank awesome, you very thank much. Awesome. Thank you so much. So no, that's homework. I'll enjoy. That's good homework. All right. Hello, thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, Scott Summers, and I'm a specialist in the United States Space Force. Uh, my question for you today is, uh, can you describe what it's like to work with Stan Lee? Everybody knows he did cameos in all the movies. And uh, do you guys ever have any disagreements with some of the director choices you made? And if there were any creative disagreements, how did you guys work through those? Yeah, no, our experience with Stan Lee was extremely positive. Um, he... To be honest with you, he wasn't deeply involved in the movies. He didn't really get involved on a story level. But of course, he was, you know, he was up there in age when we started working with him. So he would just come in, he would come in the set, he would have this energy that would light everybody up. Stan knew, I think he knew his effect on people. And he he wanted to sort of bring a really positive energy to everybody. So when he would walk on set, like normally when you're working on set, you know, there's, um, you know, there's a, probably a couple hundred people working, but any given time, you're only seeing maybe 30 of them. But when Stan walks on set, all of a sudden you can see all 200, you know, everybody sort of like gathers because um, they want to get a look at him and, and hear what he has to say. And he just brings a lot of positive energy. He'll make a lot of jokes. He'll, he'll make a lot of references about what the material, what the scene is or what, what, what inspired the scene. Um, and then he'll sort of, when we start working with him as an actor, he has like a million pitches. Like he'll have a lot of different lines that he wants to try. He wants to do it different ways. And it's kind of fun working with him on that. Um, but other than that, and then he sort of gives everybody a good goodbye, but that, that's basically what our experience was with him. It wasn't, he never really commented on the movies as a whole. It was very much focused on the moment and making sure that he made a good connection with everybody there and that he knew he knew what people's expectations were of him and he sort of exceeded them always, which is, I, I thought I found fascinating, especially at his age. That's a great question from Scott Summers, which actually is also the name of Cyclops in the X-Men and Space Force. Of course, <laughs> so <laughs> fitting. Just okay. fitting. Uh, I believe we have one more question from, uh, from the room. Thank you guys. Hello, gentlemen. I am Second Lieutenant Gabriel Freund from Oakland, California. Sure. You're both extremely successful. The Avengers Endgame grossed $2.8 billion at the box office. This is an incredible accomplishment, but I'm sure it was not achieved without your fair share of adversity. For example, your first film was financed with student loans and credit cards. Do any life lessons particularly resonate from this achievement? Yes, I think many, many do. But one of the ones I found most delightful and surprising was that no matter how, like, again, we're, like you mentioned, we're used to making movies for very little money. And that, you know, was much of our career. But the thing I learned making the MCU movies, and especially through Endgame, is that no matter how much money you have, you still eventually run out of money. And that was, that was a, kind of a, a fun lesson to learn. Um, because here, look at financial limitations are part of the process with filmmaking. I think part of the process, of course, with life and anything we do. And Joe and I have always said that like those kind of limitations just force you to come up with creative solutions. And that's always been our process as filmmakers is how do you, how do you overcome your limitations through, through creative solutions? Um, and I think that would be the lesson I, I, I think is most important um, to take away is that you, you're not going to, you know, even though you're making the biggest movies in the world and, you know, there, you have big Hollywood studios throwing every amount of, amount of money they have at them, that's not the answer. The answer still is at the end of the day, those creative solutions that you're all going to, you're going to find within yourself and you're going to find with your collaborators that are going to sort of get you to where you want to go.
Awesome. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. 603rd Air Communication Squadron, we appreciate your time today. All right, Anthony, this is truly a global event. We've got questions in the queue from Virginia, Washington, D.C., Hawaii, California, Germany, Guam, Texas, Nebraska, Georgia, Afghanistan, North Carolina, Spain, Kentucky, New York, Florida, Ohio, and more. So let's try and get some of the service members and their families' questions answered, if that's okay with you. From Richard Marin, would you make a Quicksilver origin movie? Huh. Well, you know, the, the, we always have a, a problem answering these questions because, uh, look, we had an amazing experience with Marvel. And it's, it was among the favorite things we've ever done in our careers. And the people at Marvel are among the best people we've ever worked with. So we would go back to work with Marvel in a second. We don't have any plans to. But it, it certainly is possible in the future that we, we may go do that. And the problem is talking about it, you know, any, my brother and I always find ourselves making jokes about what we might do if we ever went back because we can't really talk about the real things that are motivating us to go back there. We can't talk about because we want to keep them secret until we actually make them. So it's difficult to talk about, but certainly, certainly that sound, sounds like a fun idea. All right. We've got a question from Ethan Schatz, who's actually on set for uh, one of your films, Avengers Endgame. He was an extra in the background in Georgia. He's curious about if you consider shooting again in Ohio, and if you can give a little bit of context of what that process is for site location selection. Yeah, it's you know it's become very interesting. The this is going back a few decades now, but you know there certain you know when the United States started to dominate uh, filmmaking globally, a lot of countries started to develop tax rebates and incentives for their own national filmmaking industries because they wanted to protect them and promote them uh, against this sort of giant uh, uh, United States filmmaking mm -hmm. industry. And that kind of spread, that kind of, uh, that spread to uh, localities developing tax rebates and incentives for film production. Mm -hmm. And so today, filmmaking is kind of dominated by those tax rebates and incentives because their so, filmmaking is expensive. And if you're you have a locality that is willing to offer you a tax rebate in order to shoot there, that means you get to spend more of the money that you have on the actual movie and not on taxes. It is a very powerful motivation for filmmakers uh, because you know we always say you want all the money to end up on the screen. That's sort of our our uh, ethos. So. Um, so we tend to like gravitate almost exclusively to localities that offer those tax rebates. Mm -hmm. And Ohio does offer a good tax rebate right now. So that it's, it's made it viable as a filming location. And that's, that's very been amazing for us because Joe and I are from Cleveland. We've shot four movies in Cleveland. You know, Cleveland is the setting of, of our new movie, Cherry. The, the city has always spoken to us on a creative level very powerfully. So we, we are grateful for the opportunity to be able to go there and shoot movies and have it work on a financial level as well. It would be a very difficult proposition for us to go shoot in Cleveland if they didn't offer that tax rebate. Mm -hmm. There would be a lot of pressure for us to, to go to somewhere like Michigan or Toronto or something, you know, another place that may offer the tax rebate. So that's kind of what drives things, unfortunately. Now, sometimes I resent that because you know, I, you know, you want the freedom to go wherever the movie wants you to go. But at the same time, the, the, the value of that tax rebate is uh, you can't turn away from it. There are several questions about directing and screenwriting. Do you have a preference or any comments on your process? About screenwriting? Screenwriting and directing. What have you learned? What's your attempt? What's your approach? It's sort of the, we kind of have a very similar approach to every step of the process. You know screenwriting the great thing about screenwriting is that it's very inexpensive you know it's basically paper and a computer you know so you are able to experiment in the screenwriting phase in a way that's relatively cheap you know it's just it's basically your time so joe and i tend to try out a lot of ideas during the screenwriting phase because it's 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 easy to do it there once you get to the shooting phase and you have all those resources assembled mm -hmm. uh, to make the film that that those resources are expensive that time is very expensive so by the time you get to shooting you can still experiment but you you know you have to you, you have to have a pretty narrow agenda 
or else you're going to run out of money real quick or you're going to end up spending money on things that aren't going to end up in the movie which doesn't do you any good so that, i would say that's the major difference between those two phases um, is you have a lot more freedom in the screenwriting phase. Uh, I'll also say there's an, a filmmaking adage that my brother and I always cite, we really loved, and it says that you make the movie three times over, mm-hmm. when you write it, when you shoot it, and when you edit it. Mm-hmm. It is very true that each of those processes are very distinct and different from one another, because how a movie reads on a page is one thing, but how it actually stages when you, actually, when you go to shoot it mm-hmm. is sometimes another thing. And then of course, what you shoot and what you're looking at in the edit room can sometimes be a very different thing. And you sort of, you have to be open to reinventing the movie at every stage of that process because your new opportunities are presenting themselves as you move through the filmmaking process. And you want to be open to what those new opportunities can offer to the, to the essence of the movie you're trying to create. All right. Well, Anthony, we can't thank you enough for your time today. If you have one opportunity, this is it. What's your message of support for the troops around the world? Oh, man. Um, I would just say that, look, you know, everybody here in America, including myself, every, you know, owes you such a debt of gratitude for your service. And I think it's really important, not just to our country, but to our world at large. Um, I believe that the United States is a force for good. And I believe that we can help, we've been leading the world in the right direction. And I think we can continue to lead the world in the right direction. And certainly um, our military is a very important part of how we do that. So um, thank you all for your service and uh, keep, keep fighting the good fight. All right, Anthony, thank you so much for everybody that's joining us today on behalf of the USO. Thank you for joining today's MVP event. And remember to visit uso.org MVP for all future MVP event details. Mm-hmm.